here's an idea. Maybe the How I Met Your Mother finale wasn't entirely for the audience. Maybe this goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyways. This episode is about the finale of How I Met Your Mother, so if you don't wanna know anything about that, you are definitely in the wrong place. Um, there are probably some really good, like, cute goat videos that need watching. <laughs> For nine years, How I Met Your Mother was sitcom television's Garden of Forking Paths, a progression of tightly knit events where the riddle's answer, who be this mother, is built atop a mountain of clever at the peak of which someone meets an untimely demise. That's spoiler number one. And even though it seemed at points like it was going to go on forever and risk becoming instead sitcom TV's Library of Babel, the show is finally over. The mother we waited so long to meet dies and narrator Ted ends up with Robin, a character with whom his relationship has most closely resembled that of Antony and Cleopatra, without all the war. Responses to the finale have been mixed, to put it lightly. I was sitting there gobsmacked. The corpus of critical reaction is much larger and more awesome than we have time for here, links in the doobly-doo, but it basically falls into two camps. The first camp was into it. Ted and Robin were never not going to be together. Given its creative raison d'etre, How I Met Your Mother ended not only exactly how it should have, but given the circumstances, how it probably would have in real life. And also, let's be honest, the chance that Ted was ever going to end up with anybody other than Robin are about as good as the chances of putting a quarter in that toy thing at the supermarket and turning the deal in and getting the toy you want the first try. It's just not going to happen. The other camp hated it. Ted and Robin? Together? What? Ugh. The mysterious mother, who wasn't with us until this season, was but a narrative contrivance for keeping audiences on board, and once she served her purpose, was oft to allow for an ending aiming at unexpected, but which landed squarely in silly TV grasp at relevancy in its final moments country. This is all boiled down, I think, into one central question seized and raised by tons of the critical discourse. Did How I Met Your Mother earn its ending of having Ted and Robin be together? Did the writers provide adequate context and justification for their legend I'm not gonna make you wait for it, Dairy Show and its gargantuan audience. Which, aha, uh -huh, is the 50-yard line you might draw down the middle of the field upon which the game of How I Met Your Mother criticism is played. On one side, the ending offends a portion of the audience's sensibilities. On the other side, the ending isn't even for the audience. It is rather consistent with the motivations of the characters, whatever about the audience. This is an important question in basically any creative endeavor. How much and how do you consider the audience? It's especially important for artworks that tell stories. And yes, we are going to talk about television in the context of artistic practice. Because for the most part, stories are successful only if the audience understands, can follow, and is invested. As far as the narrative arts are concerned, that is the dream. Film directors like David Lynch, Andrei Tarkovsky, and even Jacques Tati push the limits of how much a story can rely on visuals alone or some mysterious internal logic. How little can you give an audience before they become completely alienated from the thing? Looking at you, Vanilla Sky. And even though I love you, also kind of looking at you, Primer. You start the machine with a weeble at the A.N. It travels okay, forward north. You, you gotta write this down. Contemporary art has long struggled with the ultimate utility of audiences well, getting it. Artist Lawrence Vena, whose work exists most visibly as bold capital letter text, said in an interview to Willoughby Sharp in 1971, think of art publications much as you would medical journals. Medical journals deal with problems common to all men. Art deals with problems common to all men within a culture, but most people sitting in a doctor's office picking up medical journals can't make head or tail of what's going on. I think assuming that Joe and Joanne everybody know as much about art as they do about medical science is a little elitist, which is a thing that Vena cops to right after this line. But this does illustrate an acceptance and maybe a little bit of a celebration of the fact that sometimes art needs to art on its own terms in order to accomplish its goals. Perhaps that's as true for How I Met Your Mother and the the rest of television as it is for contemporary and fine art. Of course, this is complicated with television, which Emily Nussbaum, the TV critic for The New Yorker, recently called the red-haired stepchild of the art world on NPR's On the Media. For one thing, if you challenge a TV audience too much, they'll leave. TV audiences are notoriously fickle. Nussbaum also talks about how any artist making art entirely for their audience and not at all for themselves would probably go insane. But television, especially now, bears the marks of its viewers' expectations all over it. And so TV rarely does, and for dollar bill reasons sometimes, just plain can't deny expectation, ignore convention, or challenge its audience's presumptions to instead progress with its own internal logic. There are, of course, exceptions. We just made an entire episode about them, and 
Maybe it was always unclear whether or not How I Met Your Mother should be counted amongst them. For some people, this show was going to be the convention buster where the two romantic leads didn't end up together. For others, it was simply an honest look at adult romance, and sometimes the expected does happen. I mean, life is messy, but also sometimes it's dreadfully simple. Of all people, film crit Hulk put it really well. Hulk wrote, This show is actually about learning to see love in a more realistic, less put upon way. Look at it in terms of text, and you'll see that every time Ted sought the ideal over the earned, it didn't work out. As far as the Hulk is concerned, neither Tracy nor Robin are the one, because for Ted, and maybe anyone, there is no the one, and it's just that simple. Hulk goes on to say that the portrayal of romantic love in How I Met Your Mother, especially the finale, is laudably unpretentious. And to get caught up in the question of what the finale should have done is to miss its artfulness. The larger function of art, Hulk says, is to try and make some purposeful statement about a complex idea of meaning or import often at the cost of conventional thought or expectation itself. The question is, then, how much conventional thought and expectation can be spent before the audience goes broke? On his blog Terrible Minds, novelist Chuck Wendig writes, I appreciate that they may be telling the story I don't expect, but you don't orchestrate an ending so much as you have to earn it. You build a foundation and then you create architecture based on that foundation, and the taller you go, the more married to that design you are. You can't build some fancy skyscraper and then put a giant ceramic clown taking a dump on top of it. You don't put a windmill on an igloo because you really love windmills and hate igloos. This is Ted Mosby 101, people. Meaning, for Chuck at least, the justification given for the unexpected was unsatisfactory. A work of art might have its own internal logic, but even if that logic is bizarre, it still has to be consistent, purposefully inconsistent, or simply enjoyable in its own right. And here, we arrive at the buggiest of all the bugbears. It's the simply enjoyable that's the most complicated. We view the world and our lives as narrative, and we view narrative, especially sitcom narrative, as though it were a mirror for the world. Composer and librettist Robert Ashley wrote once about television's, quote, preoccupation with vicarious experience that most sane people hope they will never have. But television is also, like every other artwork, also preoccupied with its context. It's about the world, sure, but it's also about other creative acts, the conventions of those creative acts, and itself. Well, what's the show about? It's about nothing. <laughs> Cramming all of that stuff into one package that is consistent and or simply enjoyable can be tough. It can be downright stressful even. Thank you, Linus. What do you guys think? Was the How I Met Your Mother finale more for the characters than for the audience? And how much should an artist consider their audience? Is it different for television? Let us know in the comments. And let me tell you about How I Met Your Mother. It was at the grocery store. She was very nice. She's very proud of you. My up band died this morning and didn't count the steps on the way to the train, and that made me really sad, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Let's see what you guys had to say about the quantified self. Daniel Hoff and Mushroom Man 3rd seem to have conflicting ideas of what effective tracking and incentivization looks like. Um, Daniel Hoff seems to go the route of uh, in gentle encouragement, whereas Mushroom Man 3rd talks about disincentivizing, uh, and like, when you fail a goal or something, you are debited $5 to, you know, a service or a charity or something. This is why this stuff is so complicated, because it's clearly not one side fits all, and I think that's not really expressed in this technology yet. And when it is, it'll be totally different. Leo Sinclair, Kiefer N, and JC Arrieta all leave comments about how important it is to interpret this data within the larger context of your life story, your health history, your family health history, um, and that, you know, this is a thing that will augment your understanding, but it should never actually replace it. And I think that this is a really great insight, and I wonder if this is part of the future of this technology, is to sort of appeal to some expert sense. I don't know, but this is, these, are, these are really insightful comments, I think. Craig Doucette, Hannah Kenny, and Eric Swain raise some questions about the privacy related to the quantified self. And this also makes me think of, uh, I forget which insurance company it is, but they have a little gizmo you can put in your car, and based upon the uh, information that it gathers, uh, you can get a lower insurance premium, but then you realize that you have a gadget from an insurance company in your car, which I don't know, that makes me really uncomfortable. And so maybe this should also make me uncomfortable. Ah, I don't know. I'm conflicted. This is, yeah, this is complicated. 
VDVOV writes a really great comment about diabetes and the danger of letting this quantified knowledge replace your embodied knowledge. And I think, yeah, like not, not letting the technology dictate something that feels wrong um, in your body is, you know, a, a danger. You know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a thing that lots of people are concerned about into the growing technological current future. Um, you know, I think the important thing to remember is, right, sort of like what VDVOV says, it's, it's about your agency with the technology and it's not the technology itself. And you can choose, sometimes rightfully so, to just abandon it. AJB65 and Mike WDP both write comments expanding on the kind of Foucauldian subtext of a lot of what I said. And I think, like, you know, in the event that this does turn into a two or more episode series about the quantified self, I think this might be the next thing to talk about, to really talk about biopolitics. But these comments are great. Links to these and all the other comments in the doobly-doo. You should read them. To Aaron Gross, I am in fact uh, left-handed to unquestionable logic. We are starting to gather links to assets in the doobly-doo. We're not great at it, but we're getting better. And to the MKU project. You just wait. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these McLaren's regulars. We have an IRC, a Facebook, and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. We also got nominated for some webbies with a bunch of my friends who are all very talented. So if you do go there and don't end up voting for us, let's just say that I totally understand. And this week's Tweet of the Week comes from Marie Soulier, who links us to a video of a song about social media from a social media conference. It is exactly how you imagine it. Glorious.